Hi, Jeff Snow here from my office again. Much last week we hid in here from a bat that was flying around the sanctuary at First Baptist here in Fort Hope. Um, I'm not sure where he is now, but I'm still safely in my office, so hopefully the sound will come across okay. I've been trying to share messages that are timeless, that whether you watch them the Sunday that we put them on our channel, or whether you watch them in 2023, they would still be timeless messages from scripture. And I hope this one has a timelessness to it as well, but I'm gonna talk about some of the events that have happened over the last week or two. We are in the middle of a situation where an unarmed black man in Minneapolis, Minnesota was killed by a police officer. And it has sparked protests, it has sparked discussion, it has sparked some rioting and looting, it has sparked a lot of things. And um, the first passage of scripture that came to my mind when this happened, and I've seen it posted in a lot of other places as well, was Micah 16. He has shown you, O man, O woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I want to look at each of those three parts today. I don't pretend to be a Hebrew scholar by any stretch of imagination, but did a bit of research and hopefully can share some, some thoughts of how these three commands from the Lord apply to us. But to do justly, the Hebrew word is, if I pronounce it correctly, mishpat. And the emphasis here is on action, do justly, not just is a different word for having the right attitude that leads to justice. This is actually doing something. This is treating people equitably, treating people as, as equals. It's about giving people the same rights, the same God-given rights that anybody else has. This includes you know, all kinds of things, the right not to be stopped on the street by the police just because of the color of your skin. It, it means um, having the same opportunities. Um, I'm wearing my hockey hat this week instead of my baseball hat. But um, I've been revisiting a lot of videos and stories and books over the last couple of weeks about the history of Major League Baseball. Because you see, for the first 60 years of Major League Baseball, Every baseball player in Major League Baseball, Minor League Baseball, they all had one thing in common, and that was the color of their skin. They were all white. In the 1880s, Major League Baseball put into place this unwritten but ironclad rule that African Americans could not play baseball on the same team as white Americans. And so they were people who, players who had as much or more ability than some of the great stars of, of baseball that we hear about, like the Babe Ruths and Lou Gehrig's, they were shunted aside. And they formed their own leagues called Negro Leagues, to use the expression of the day, where they could play, but it wasn't the same. Separate but unequal. And they did not have the same opportunities, did not have the same rights, did not experience mishpat, did not experience um, being done justly. Until 1946, when somebody came along and changed everything. And we'll talk about him in a couple of minutes. To give people the same rights as everyone else. And there's a lot of things that have disturbed me over the last couple of weeks as I've watched what has gone on. But I'm also struck by the fact that people don't have the rights to riot. People don't have the rights to walk into someone's business establishment and take things that don't belong to them. That's not part of their civil rights. President Barack Obama, in response to the Baltimore riots in 2015, said that when people do that, that's not a protest. That's not... Um, 
that's not making a statement. He said that's a crime. And they need to be treated like criminals. This was President Obama in 2015. It's important that the idea of mishpat doesn't get lost in that. Though. The idea that we want to be able to treat everyone, not just think of it as everyone, but treat everyone with the same God-given rights that we have. Mishpat is about taking up the care and cause of the vulnerable. And over the last couple of weeks, it is African Americans, African Canadians, that we are becoming more and more aware of the vulnerability that they face. But a couple of weeks ago, there was a whole different story in the news about the most vulnerable group of people in Canada, how 80% of people who died from COVID are living in seniors' homes. And there have been calls to, to do something about it. And sometimes in society, these calls to do something, to exercise mishpat, um, gain momentum for a while, but then they go on the back burner as other things happen. And the number of times the, the, the plight of people in seniors' homes has come to the forefront. But mishpat means taking care of, doing justly means taking care of, taking up the cause of the vulnerable, whether they are African Canadians, African Americans, whether they are seniors, people living in seniors' homes. God talks about the vulnerable. He describes them in different ways. In one passage in Psalms, he talks about being a, that he's a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. And it's a controversial point and statement, but the statistics bear it out. And there was a report decades ago that pointed to the fact that 65% of African American people have come from single parent homes. The largest per percentage of anybody, any people group in, in the US. And that's just stating a fact. But the question of Mishpat is, what are we going to do about it? It's not about pointing a finger and saying, that's not good, or it's your fault. What are we going to do about it? There are people, the man, I speak to fatherlessness. There are people in our society, because of divorce, because of um, people you know, having casual sex without being married, and having kids as a result. There, I remember, always remember one teenager in a discussion with my youth group one time, looked at me in the eyes and said, I am the result of a one night stand. That has impacted her all through her life, or else she wouldn't have told me that. And Mishpat, do justly, calls us to do something about it. And I'm challenged with that this week. Even though I am trying. I try very hard personally to make mentoring a part of who I am and part of what I do. And there's been many young people over the years that have tried really hard to be a father figure too. I know there are many more in my life that I could be mentoring. And maybe God is calling you as somebody who was raised in a good home, somebody who has a good home, somebody who has resources, somebody who has knowledge, somebody who has grown up in Christ, Maybe God is calling you to, to disciple and mentor a younger person, to walk with them in their relationship with Christ, but also to walk with them through life, to walk with them um, through the, the aloneness, the abandonment they may feel, walk with them through all the barriers that they feel society may be putting up against them, walk with them through the confusion of being a young person. God, what are, you going to, what are we going to do about it? Not just think about it, but do something about it. Who's God calling you to mentor? Again, if I'm saying these words correctly, the words mishpat and zedekay are often put together in the Old Testament dozens of times. Justice and righteousness. Justice, right view of humans. Righteousness, right view of being right with God. Right view of God. Mishpat is coming to the aid of victims of unjust behavior. Tedeke is having such a right relationship with God 
that, that unjust behavior becomes less and less a part of who we are and less and less a part of society so that mishpat isn't needed as much. Zedeke speaks to the system, systemic issues that we hear a lot about, systemic racism and systemic issues. But the problem with that phrase is if we blame systems, we, we can, systems are this nebulous thing that, that what is a system? Systems are people. People make up systems. Systems are made up of people who need a right relationship with God, who need to be, know why they were created, and to live in such a way that, that, that God works through them so that they will do justly, and so that the systemic thing will begin to not be such a huge part anymore. And people will be able to um, have others come and, and, and walk with them through injustice, and to deal with injustice, and to be cared for through injustice. Justice and righteousness, the two that go together. This verse in Micah has three sections to it. And I think the do justly part is the part that stands out the most. In, this, in our situations we're facing right now and, and in a lot of situations. But there's a second part that says, love mercy. Uh, chesed, I believe is how it's pronounced in the Hebrew, and it means kindness. Kindness extended especially to the lowly, the needy, the vulnerable, to show mercy. To show mercy as God has shown mercy to us, to Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's a story that came that happened in the news in 2015 that actually is a little hard to find on the internet. Not as, not as easy to find as all the protests of years gone by. One day in Charleston, South Carolina, a young white man walked into a church and about 12 to 15 black people were having a Bible study at the front of the church. And his name was Dylan, and they welcomed Dylan to come into the Bible study and be a part of what they were doing, and reached out to him, and made him feel welcome. Even though it was a black um, AME church, they welcomed this young white man, not knowing that this young white man had a Facebook page full of racist, white supremacist, anti-black, violent language and images. And at some point in the Bible study, Dylan pulled out a gun and began shooting. And nine people died in that Charleston church, the Emanuel AME church in Charleston, South Carolina. And a couple of days later, in at court, and Dylan was arrested and charged and he was caught dead to rights and he was guilty. A couple of days later, they, the families had an opportunity to speak to Dylan through post circuit television. And, and an amazing thing happened. A number of family members said to Dylan, I forgive you. And I hope and pray that you will come to repentance and find Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers. I don't know if I could do that. I hope I could. I hope that God would give me the strength to be able to do that. But it shows great, amazing, amazing strength. And about three years later, I was watching it today on, on YouTube, on the Today Show. Three of the family members were interviewed, and they talked about um, that it was a process of forgiveness, and it's not always easy, but they knew that it was the right thing to do, and they knew that God was with them through it. And one of the ladies said, we often think in forgiving someone, we're letting them off the hook. But that's not the case, because justice still needs to be done. Dylan is still in prison and probably stay there the rest of his life. But forgiveness, she said, lets me off the hook. It frees my soul, frees my spirit. Jesus said in one of his stories to his disciples that, one of the disciples asked, how often should I forgive someone? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. 
And I heard it said once, and I thought this really made a lot of sense. That when Jesus was talking, he wasn't saying you need to forgive, you know, 490 different people with different things they've done to you. Although like that's probably part of it too. He was saying you need to forgive the same person for the same thing 490 times. Because what happens is we forgive, but then it comes up again, and we get angry and hurt, and, and, and we need to forgive again. And then it comes up again, and, and we revisit the whole situation, and we have to forgive again. And there comes a time when you break, and it breaks, and you forgive, and the hold it has on you breaks, and you're free. That's what forgiveness is all about. And when we love mercy, we are called to walk in that forgiveness. I saw someone ask a question on social media this week that was a little jarring. He said, what if Derek Chauvin, what if that police officer who killed George Floyd, what if he finds Christ? What if he legitimately, legitimately repents of his sins, repents of what he did, and finds Christ. How would we respond as Christians? How would we respond as a society in general? And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, the fake kind of conversions that, that people sometimes use sometimes. I'm talking about real and genuine. That doesn't mean he gets out of prison. It doesn't mean justice isn't served. But what if like last week, we were talking about the woman caught in adultery and brought before Jesus. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. How would we feel about Jesus saying that to that police officer if he really came to Jesus in forgiveness and repentance? Love, mercy. What would we say to the people who have looted or rioted or killed other innocent black men during this time? Do justly. Justice is served, but God also calls us to love mercy. It's hard. But nothing that God commands us to do, that was going grammatically incorrect. God never commands us to do something without giving us the strength to do it. And when the time comes for us to love mercy, I believe that if we lean upon God, he will give us what we need. Do justly, love mercy, mercy, walk humbly with your God. Tisana is the word. Walk humbly. It means to walk lowly, modestly. Even when it means the word humiliate, be humiliated. Charles Spurgeon writes, true humility is thinking rightly of thyself, not meanly. But when you have found out what you really are, you will be humble, for you are nothing to boast of. When we Truly look inside ourselves, not to beat ourselves over the head and shame ourselves, but truly look into ourselves, walk humbly before God. Say to God, like the psalmist, see if there's any wicked way in me. Then there's a true power that can change us. And God is calling many of us in this time to truly examine ourselves before God, see if there's any wicked way in me. Is there any racism? Is there bigotry? Is there, is there prejudice? Is there anything that would prevent me from having a right relationship with someone else and, and want them to be able to be treated equitably? And then as we walk humbly before God, we ask him, God, cut it out of me. Change me. If there is something there that needs to be changed, Cut it out. Help you to walk humbly before you. But walk humbly also involves the response to injustice. And when we protest and when we um, demonstrate against injustice, this third passage, this third command, I believe also applies. To walk humbly before our God. I was saying before about a uh, baseball player who changed everything after 60 years of only white players being allowed to play Major League Baseball. And his name was Jackie Robinson. And 
The second part of his story is a guy named Branch Rickey, a Methodist Christian who was part of the baseball establishment for 50 years and knew very early on that something was very wrong in the way things were being done. But it was only during World War II when he felt the time was right and there was an opportunity there to change things. And so he set about looking for the person, the baseball player, the African-American baseball player who could be a part of what has become known as baseball's noble experiment. And he called Jackie Robinson into his office in Brooklyn in August of 1945, and he explained to him <coughs> what his plan was, that he would go and play baseball in Montreal, my hometown, why I feel so connected to this story, and he would play for the Montreal Royals, a white minor league baseball team. And the following year, he would come and play for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the first African-American in major league baseball in 60 years. And Jackie Robinson was kind of stunned. He was like, I didn't, didn't know why you were calling me in my, into your office. And this, you know, are, you, are you for real? Can this really happen? Imagine the thoughts were going through his head. And then Branch Rickey spent the next little while in the interview play acting and role playing all the different situations that Jackie Robinson would face. Branch Rickey was a man not given to profanity, but in this situation, he swore at Jackie Robinson. He called him every name in the book that would, he would be called. He talked about scenarios where, you know, he would, pitchers would throw at his head. And in base running, people would come along with their spikes on their shoes and they would gouge into his, into his leg and they would, they would try and start fights with him. And he asked Jackie Robinson, what would you do? And Robinson said, are, are you looking for someone who's afraid to fight back? And Ricky said, no, I'm looking for someone who has the guts not to fight back. And as they discussed it some more, both being Methodist Christians, the whole concept of Jesus commanding the Beatitudes to turn the other cheek became prominent in their conversation. And there's one account of, this, of the, their interview where, where Ricky says, what if some guy comes along and just plows you right in the cheek. And Robinson looked at him and said, Mr. Ricky, I have two cheeks. And Ricky told Robinson that if this was going to succeed for three years, we will have to promise not to fight back, not to answer curse for curse, not to answer insult for insult, not to answer physical threat for physical threat, to turn the other cheek. Because he said, if this is going to work, People have to be convinced that you're a fine ball player and a fine gentleman. You have to be able to see past and be won over and learn to see how wrong their racism is by the way that you act in front of them. And so Robinson agreed. And it was humbling. It was even humiliating, I'm sure. And he suffered from ulcers as he kept everything in. And there were times when he was tempted to quit, but he never, ever gave up. And this was 1947, years before Martin Luther King, years before the, the bigger parts of the civil rights movement. This was the beginning. Because of what he did, he shamed other baseball owners into hiring African-American players. And things began to change. It wasn't easy. Robinson died when he was 53. Doctors said it was from diabetes-induced heart failure. But some of his friends and family, and baseball colleagues said what killed him was the fight. What killed him was having to hold it all in and fight against the system. But he walked humbly to a degree that I can't even imagine. And because he walked humbly, Things changed because people like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. walked humbly before God. Things changed. On Jackie Robinson's tombstone is written, "A life that is not a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives." And we have an impact on other lives when we do justly, when we love mercy. 
and when we walk humbly with our God. Father, help us to do those three things. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us to live lives of justice. To live lives to actively care for those who are vulnerable in our society. To be able to see things through their eyes. And to do things, not just talk about things, but do things that will make a difference. Help us to love mercy. To forgive as we have been forgiven by you. To forgive even what seems unforgivable. And to show the mercy that you've given us. And help us, Lord, to walk humbly, to humbly come before you and say, is there any wicked way in you? And Lord, root it out. Help us, Lord, to respond to injustice by walking humbly before you. And as we walk humbly before you, you lift us up. Give us the power and authority that comes from living in humility. Lord, we pray for your peace. We pray for your will to be done. We pray for you to be honored and glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.